Nancy Liu in Ontario, Canada, where a California company is literally testing the waters of deep sea mining. This is part of what's being called the next gold rush. It's a mineral rich nodule from the bottom of the ocean where there are billions of them. And this technology being developed by Impossible Metals is in the worldwide race to get them. Well, the mission is really to deliver critical minerals to the world to allow a whole range of new industries like electrification, like defense, like infrastructure. The world desperately needs huge quantities of, of metals. How aggressive is the race worldwide? It's, it's really aggressive. I mean, globally, I think about 25% of vehicles are now electric. China is over 50%, so many, many parts of the world are replacing oil and gas with electrification. Electrification fundamentally needs metal. How is Impossible's technology different from what the rest of the world is doing? Uh, so polymetallic nodules, these potato-sized rocks, uh, there are quite a lot of people now attempting to harvest or mine these from the ocean. But the reason I created the company was I was concerned about the environmental destruction that the older technology was doing. So it's basically a big dredging machine that gets lowered to the seabed floor and it vacuums up these rocks and brings them to the surface. Uh, there is a large amount of environmental pushback against that. And so we designed a brand new 21st century approach of using underwater robotics that hover and don't land and use their array of cameras to look for life. And if we see it, we don't disturb it. Tell me about the nodules. Why are these so, uh, uh, I mean, why do we want them so badly? <laughs> well, they are the planet's biggest source of nickel and cobalt. These are two very important metals for batteries, but also for defense. They also have large quantities of copper and manganese. So these are all very important, what we would call critical metals that are needed for electrification and a whole range of industrial applications. And today, no one has actually mined these. So it is possible to find them in massive quantities on the deep ocean. And we believe we can extract them with much less cost than traditional land-based mining. How hard is it to get to the bottom of the ocean? We're talking miles into the ocean. Yeah, it's up to four miles deep. And, and so that does present unique challenges. The pressure is just incredible. It can be 600 times the atmospheric pressure. So everything that we build has to be in pressure vessels that protect it against that immense pressure. Also, you have the seawater, the, the, the salt, that's corrosive. So you have to design a vehicle to deal with this harsh environment. You also have an environment where radio waves don't work. So you have to find other ways to communicate. Basically, we use acoustic communication. I've seen the animation that Impossible has put out. I mean, you envision a future with a vessel that, with many of these robots. Tell us about how you hope to harvest these nodules. Yeah, so fundamentally what we will do is we'll use a, a bulk shipping container and we'll retrofit onto it a unique launch and recovery system, a crane that puts the vehicles into the water and we'll have a fleet of the vehicles, maybe a hundred or more in time. And then once the vehicles get placed into the water, they're fully autonomous. So they have a battery and they use their own propulsion, their own buoyancy system to dive up to four miles deep but they don't land. They hover uh, a few uh, feet above the seabed, and then they use their array of cameras to look for each of these. And if we don't see life, then we control a robotic arm array to actually pick them one by one and store them in the vehicle. Once the payload is full, the vehicle uses its buoyancy system to float to close to the surface, where we recover the vehicle, empty the payload, swap the battery, do any maintenance, and then redeploy. You've talked about the environmental pushback. There is great concern about marine life. Yep. Tell us how Impossible's technology will protect sea life. Yeah, I think the first thing to, to realize is that at the deep ocean, there is no light. We're talking up to four miles deep. There is life, but the vast majority of it is microscopic, it's bacterial life. So the life that is there is quite unique and special, but it's very small quantities of it. We see deep sea corals, sponges, there's a species of octopus, but it's not very common. 
Compare that to a rainforest where 75% of the world's nickel today comes from an Indonesian rainforest. Massive amounts of biodiversity. So just to start with, we have an environment that has much less life and the vast majority of it is, is microscopic and bacterial. We go further. With our technology, we're actually looking for that life that we can see, that coral, the sponge. We have a big, powerful NVIDIA processor and we use AI algorithms to look and in real time, if we see a coral or a sponge, we put a virtual circle around it and the vehicle says, do not disturb anything within that circle and it just flies over the top without, without impacting it. What other tactics are out there that is really disturbing to well, sea life? The, the ironic thing is that the first testing of polymetallic seabed mining happened in the 1970s. And that technology is basically what everyone else is using. So there are a number of Chinese companies, there are a number of European companies, there are Indian, uh, there are South Korean companies that have all built this dredging tractor. So it's a big machine with tracks that gets lowered to the seabed floor and then it injects water in the front of the machine and it vacuums up everything that is there and that goes through a riser pump system which is a, basically a tube to the support ship and on the support ship it removes the water in the sediment and then pumps that back down. So, so you're really kicking up the sediment. Yeah, so the amount of sediment because you have tracks and you're injecting water and you have a discharge plume is significantly larger versus our vehicle that's hovering. We will have a bit of disturbance as we pick, but it will be substantially less. Um, and so we have tried to minimize the sediment disturbance. We preserve the biodiversity by avoiding the ones that have life. In addition, we have a policy of leaving 60% of these undisturbed. So that's a way to just preserve the microbes and the life, the bacteria that we can't see. We've minimized our noise and light footprint, and we've committed to be net zero from volume production as well. You mentioned China. China yeah. has been very aggressive in developing its technologies for deep sea mining. I guess, are we behind? How far behind are we as the US? I, I, I think China is very active in deep sea mining. They actually have five licensed areas in international water. Uh, two of their companies are testing collection technology this year, but it is the older style. So we have an opportunity to actually move ahead with newer technology. Because one of the things we haven't talked about, not only do we have all this environmental benefits, we also are significantly less expensive. We avoid the need for this dedicated ship and we're fully automated. So we think we're about two thirds the cost. So we think we have an opportunity to leapfrog. What about timeline? How soon can we see impossible in the waters, in the oceans? So we, we have done testing, even with uh, Eureka 2 that we're, we're deploying right now. We've tested that off Florida. Uh, so we have gone you know, over a mile deep autonomously. But what we need to do now is, is really build the full size system. This vehicle is a proof of concept. It proves everything, but it's not large enough for a commercial mining operation. So we have designed Eureka 3, the next version. It's significantly larger. It's the size of a 20 foot shipping container. That is the version that would ultimately go to production. So what we have ahead of us is, is build and test Eureka 3, the full size system one, which we hope to do next year and then build a fleet of them and deploy that fleet, which we would hope to do in 2028. What do you have to say to the critics who say, you know, we can just recycle all of the old cell phones and things that we're just discarding all the time? What, I mean, why not mind just take those? Because there frankly is not enough material. If you look at the International Energy Association that writes reports, they have said that for nickel, in 2030, five years from now, 3% of nickel demand will be met by recycling and second use. And in 2040, just 10%. So the reality is that the demand is so big and it takes such a long time for material to be available for recycling that we have at least a few decades before recycling has a meaningful impact to the amount of primary mining that we need. How hard is it to extract the various minerals from the nodule? 
Uh, that's mineral processing and it's very similar to land-based okay. uh, processing. So you can basically use an existing land-based processing plant with some more small modifications. So that's what uh, a company in Japan has proven that you can do. Of course, here in, you know, in the US, we really do need to invest in building new mineral processing capabilities. And so that's something we, we want to see. Also, the, the President's Executive Order talked about stockpiling. And we think that's a great way to stimulate industry to invest in building the infrastructure that's needed. Does anyone police the oceans? How do we know that everyone's following rules? Yeah, so there is a, a UN created organization that has been writing rules, but they're a little bit slow. They haven't finalized the rules. And so uh, the US has its own rules and they will administer the rights. So there are basically two regulatory frameworks, but it is absolutely not a free for all. You know, a, any company that wants to do mining like us will have to submit an environmental impact statement that clearly defines what the environmental impact will be and the regulatory body will have to give approval before commercial mining can start. Should the world worry about the world's oceans given all of these nodules that are going to be picked up and how can it not change the world? Well, I think first of all you have to say is mining important or not and I would argue that civilization is fundamental on mining. If we look around, if it wasn't grown, it was mined. And all mining has an impact and comes out of the ground. So then the question is, should we mine where we have the highest impact in a rainforest in Indonesia with huge impacts to the local people there, as well as the actual environment? Or should we go to an environment that's super deep, where there's very little life, and using brand new technology to preserve it. And even if all mining happens in the deep that people are considering, we're looking at impacting a fraction of a percent of the ocean. It's not going to have a massive material impact, and the whole purpose of an environmental impact assessment is to fully study that and document it before any mining happens. We desperately need these metals. We need them for a whole range of applications. And as I said, where we get them today, they are often under the control of foreign governments. China controls something like between 50 and 90% of these resources. And that's a strategic problem. And so I think we desperately need to have our own interdependent source. And I think the seabed is the only resource of scale that we can access that can help us mitigate the concerns of China controlling this resource. How helpful is President Trump's executive order? Massively. Um, it's a night and day change from the previous administration. Uh, I think it is saying that this is a resource that U.S. actually has in its own waters as well as international. So there's economic benefits that can be done there. There are strategic benefits. Um, and it's not about saying doing this at any cost, it's about evaluating the environmental impact and making sensible decisions about the trade-offs. Um, and so we're hugely thankful for that and to see the leadership that he's, he's brought on this topic. Check it out, these are lava rocks that are used for training the prototype. They're not as heavy as the actual nodules, but they're roughly the same size and obviously not as valuable. We're here, we're here at, um, at Collingwood, yeah. um, at the, the harbour area. Okay. And this is often a site we use for, for testing. Okay. So basically we use a traditional crane, you can see right. here, that physically lifts the vehicle that we call Eureka 2 off its stand and into the water. Okay. Um, and that happened a little bit earlier. So right now you can see the crane, but the vehicle is obviously not attached because it's underwater. When you think about that it needs to go up to four miles deep, mm -hmm. it's actually surviving the pressure. So that's why we use pressure containers and right. all of the components are, are rated at that pressure. Ah. So we, we buy in things like thrusters. So these are little propellers. Mm -hmm. We buy in battery packs, lights, cameras. They typically come with a test certificate that says we have tested them at this pressure depth. Hmm. So, 
Yeah. Oh, tell us about the cameras that are used I mean, the, and the AI that's involved yeah. in, to help protect marine life. Yeah, so we use stereo cameras, just like human vision. So, mm -hmm. so that allows us, by combining the imagery together, to see in three dimensions. So just as humans have two eyes, we can detect depth, and mm. we do the same with the cameras. Um, and so we are actually using um, the Intel RealSense, which is a, uh, an Intel camera system, but we've built our own enclosure for it. Huh. And because of the depth information, we can then feed that into this AI computer vision algorithm that runs on uh, an NVIDIA graphics processor. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can basically do the, the AI detection. So fundamentally, the, the AI is, is looking for, at a very high level, three things. We're looking for the seabed, mm -hmm. we're looking for the nodules, mm -hmm. and then we're looking for anything else. And we just assume that anything else is a life, whether that's a coral, a sponge, this octopus. We don't have to have previously, previously seen the life. Mm -hmm. We just have to say, is it seabed or is it nodule? And if we detect that life, we put a virtual quarantine area around it, and the vehicle knows to not disturb anything within that Got circle. It. Most okay. underwater vehicles today are actually the Navy. So if you think about it, most militaries are moving to drones, right. drones in the air, mm. but drones in the water and under the water are AUVs. What are they on the lookout for? So they are communicating with, with the vehicle. Um, we actually have a, a cable, so you can see this cable. Yes. Um, now, we can operate the vehicle oh, in two it. modes, a okay. fully autonomous mode, okay. where we have only um, a untethered connection, yeah. but that doesn't allow us to get video or imagery data, uh -huh. because when you communicate purely through the water, radio waves don't work very well. So we have to use what's called acoustic communication using sound, mm -hmm. but it's really low bandwidth. So okay. we can get like basic status and position yeah. and we can send commands, but we can't see the videos okay. from the cameras. So in a development mode, we run an actual cable. You can see this cable, yep. it's a fiber optic cable, and that allows us to actually have real time camera data mm -hmm. from the vehicle. How's the testing been going? Uh, it's been going really well. I mean, we've done quite a lot of testing. Um, we were in the deep ocean mm -hmm. last about a year ago yeah. uh, off Florida. Um, that, was, that was a lot of learning. I mean, uh, Josh and the team were actually on the boat and, yeah. and did, did, did the work. But, um, you know, it's, 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 you learn a lot from actually going to the real ocean, right, dealing right. with the waves. And, you know, we actually were able to get the vehicle almost two kilometers deep, well over a mile. Good. And, and one of those tests we did without the tether. So it was kind of running on its automated Good. mode of operating its, its mission. What's the biggest challenge been? I mean, do you feel like the robotic arms are, are you know, pretty refined at this point? Yes, I mean, we, we have a little bit of speed improvements to do, but we've made considerable gains. I think when we first developed the first arm, we were taking seven, eight seconds to see the rock and pick it, and now we're around to just over two seconds. So it's considerable speed up that's been done over yeah. the time. Um, you know, but I think you, you learn every time you kind of put yeah. the vehicle in, into the... And it is a quite complex vehicle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's similar to building a car. It's got a lot of components in it. Now, the U.S. is in a race to catch up when it comes to deep sea mining. China leads the world in the field, aiming to mine the Pacific, Indian, and Arctic oceans and greatly influencing regulations. But with a green light from the Trump administration, Impossible Metals and other American companies, are diving deeper into the action.